the COVID-19 Emergency Response Act, which was adopted just last week on March um, uh, 25th, so received a royal assent on that day. Uh, from a social policy standpoint, um, the most important aspect of the COVID-19 Emergency Response Act is the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Uh, and it's um, a temporary program uh, that should remain in place until early October, but it can change. And, you know, often what happens during crisis, we enact temporary measures, but they can actually last longer than anticipated at the beginning when they are created. So for now, it will last until October, but it could be extended if this crisis goes on and on. So uh, what the Canada Emergency Response Benefit does is to provide uh, a taxable benefit of $2,000 a month for up to four months uh, to support workers who've lost um, their income uh, as a result of the ongoing, ongoing pandemic. So this is a program that exists alongside EI, uh, uh, Employment Insurance. And you cannot get both money from both programs all at once. But the thing that's important to understand is that EI in Canada is a, is a flawed program that often doesn't even cover half the people who are unemployed. And so by adding this new program on the side of EI, uh, you hope to um, reduce some of the gaps associated with EI and really offer emergency help for people uh, who are uh, hurting during this time of crisis and, and are uh, now uh, jobless. Other key uh, measures uh, adopted last week um, as part of the COVID-19 Emergency Response Act include the temporary increase of Canada child benefit payments, a special top-up payment under the goods and services tax, uh, so the GST credit, and a pause on the repayments of Canada student loans. So that's something that that Max Bell students might be interested in. There will also um, be an increase, a one-time funding increase of uh, $5 million uh, for the provinces through the Canada Health Transfer. Now, health healthcare costs will, of course, go up uh, quite rapidly as a consequence of this. So I suspect that this is just uh, a first installment that I suspect that uh, more money will be needed uh, for the provinces to tackle this crisis through the Canada health transfer or other means. So uh, this is an ongoing situation that we really have to follow very closely. On Friday, uh, Justin Trudeau announced, uh, so the Prime Minister announced a 75% wage subsidy for qualified businesses for up to three months, which is a program to prevent job losses. Um, so it's a different strategy than um, uh, uh, the, the one uh, embedded in the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And it's really a bold move and we don't know exactly how much money it will cost, but all these measures taken together will of course create large deficits. Uh, what's happening of course, when we have a crisis like this, it happened in 2008 in the aftermath of the financial crisis is that suddenly all governments return to Keynesianism <laughs> and, and we go uh, with deficit spending, we prime the pump, we try to <clears throat> maintain some levels of uh, income for workers or the unemployed uh, so that they keep consuming. And we want to avoid um, the downfall to be, uh, um, to be so steep. <clears throat> and so we enact these measures uh, to, to support uh, uh, people in need. But it's not just uh, from a purely social policy and economic security standpoint is from a macro economic standpoint that we do this okay and it's something that we learned during the great depression and it's something that is embedded in keynesianism which returns uh, really rapidly to the front stage uh, in times of emergency even when governments and power don't necessarily support keynesianism when there's a crisis obviously deficit spending and the spirit of the spirit of Keynesianism are, are, are back with a vengeance. And this is what we are seeing now. Um, beyond the clear similarities in national responses to the current crisis, uh, which are rooted in Keynesianism, each country responds to this ongoing situation quite differently for a number of reasons, including their fiscal capacity, which is a very important issue, the fiscal side of this. Uh, the aftermath will, will last for a long time. This is very important 
big deficits, bigger deficits than we had, certainly much bigger, and we'll have to tackle that over time. The degree to which the crisis is affecting uh, uh, these countries, because some countries um, are facing a much greater uh, public health emergency than others. Uh, some countries like Taiwan, for example, have been relatively spared, uh, and other countries like Italy are facing a, an unprecedented, really dramatic crisis. So that, the, that's also important to understand national variations in the scope of the crisis itself. Also, the nature of political institutions. Obviously, uh, federal countries like Canada, um, we, have, we face different challenges and, and also um, different, uh, uh, a different institutional context than in unitary states. And that's certainly we have to keep, uh, um, keep in mind as we move forward. And finally, existing policy legacies. So the social policies uh, and the economic policies that were already in place uh, before the, the crisis uh, began. And that's very important. Uh, these policy legacies shape in part the response of different countries. For example, in the case of Canada, I already mentioned how EI as a program is quite flawed in terms of its coverage. And uh, it, enacting the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, I think, is a recognition that EI on its own uh, is deeply flawed, especially in the period of surging unemployment, which is what we are witnessing now. And so here, uh, in the mirror of this policy legacy of EI, we created a new program instead of, sampling, uh, instead of sim simply beefing up uh, uh, EI benefits. Um, now, another question that's important here, in addition uh, uh, to really uh, explain why some countries are enacting emergency measures in certain ways and others take a different approach, uh, we have to start thinking about the potential long-term consequences of uh, uh, the current crisis. Uh, some economic uh, crisis can have a, a really enduring effect on social policy, and others, well, not so much. And so I think it's important to turn to historical and comparative analysis here uh, to really have a better understanding of the conditions under which uh, a global crisis may lead to durable policy uh, uh, legacies, can lead to durable policy change, not just temporary measures that uh, um, don't last uh, for more than, than a few months or perhaps uh, a year or two. And so I will use historical examples from Canada and the US here, starting with the Great Depression, of course. We, uh, we learn a lot from the Great Depressions. Historians, economists, sociologists, political scientists, uh, have published about the Great Depression and social policy responses to it. And I think it's always really interesting to go back to this era, in part because there is already a lot of scholarship about it. And, um, and, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's important to uh, return to this, um, um, this era today and to draw some lessons from what happened in both Canada and the US. Uh, Something that has to do with federalism, because of course Canada and the US are both federal countries. Um, the provinces and the municipalities were really overwhelmed by the Great Depression, and, and which lasted a long time, years, right? So um, the federal government had to step in. And in both countries, um, the Great Depression uh, really fostered a centralization of federalism, which was exacerbated uh, uh, by uh, the Second World War, which ended the Great Depression, <laughs> uh, because it, it really, if you look at unemployment rates during the war, they declined really dramatically. And uh, in North America, uh, uh, the Great uh, Depression uh, uh, really uh, um, was a thing of the past uh, uh, as soon as the, uh, the war effort was, uh, was um, really um, uh, moving forward. Um, but uh, certainly the centralization is, is something that, um, um, that we witnessed in both Canada and the U.S. First, through temporary programs like public works and unemployment camps, but then permanent measures uh, were enacted uh, in 1935 in both the U.S. and Canada. In the U.S., it was the Social Security Act, which was really a milestone in U.S. social policy. Uh, unemployment uh, insurance came, uh, came out of this, out of the system they adopted in the US was a decentralized one. 
the federal government levy the a payroll contribution and creating incentives for the states to create their own unemployment insurance schemes, which they've done. And they still have the system in the US today. And also so US social security old age insurance, which is still with us today. Uh, um, one of the two largest social programs in the US was created in 1935. Uh, in Canada in 1935, we adopted uh, an unemployment insurance program, but it was deemed unconstitutional uh, two years later because of federalism and because the provinces uh, uh, did not approve of this uh, move. And so the federal government had to go back to the drawing board, consult with the provinces, have them agreed on a constitutional amendment uh, uh, in order to actually implement unemployment insurance, something that was only done in 1941, after the end of the Great Depression, uh, in the midst of the Second World War. So federalism here, in that case, delayed uh, delayed the implementation of uh, what became a permanent reform, and that was enacted after the end of the, um, the Great Depression. Now let's move <laughs> forward to the Great Recession, um, much shorter than the Great Depression, at least here in Canada and the United States as well. It occurred in a very different context than uh, uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s, because we already had major social programs that already existed in both countries. Although these programs, especially programs for the unemployed, were quite flawed, both in the US and Canada. Uh, what we offer to the unemployed here under normal conditions uh, is quite ungenerous compared to what other countries around the world, especially continental European countries, are doing. Um, and so we enacted uh, uh, temporary measures to help the unemployed and stimulate the economy uh, after uh, the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, in Canada, we had a minority government uh, under Stephen Harper, and uh, they were under pressure from the opposition to spend more, and, and they did so in 2009 in the, um, the federal budget. Um, despite the fact that it was a shorter crisis, the Great Recession, it still created favorable conditions for the enactment of more durable uh, social policy reforms in both countries. In the United States, of course, there was the enactment of Obamacare in 2010, which was signed by uh, President, Obama, uh, President Obama in March 2010, so the Affordable Care Act. Um, Republicans wanted Obama to postpone, uh, and, and Democrats to postpone the advent of Obamacare, but uh, they decided to move forward, and they used the fact that the percentage of uninsured uh, had increased quite dramatically in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis to further legitimize, to further justify uh, the, uh, the, the enactment of the Affordable Care Act. So again, I'm not saying that the Affordable Care Act came out of the, the Great Recession, but suddenly the election of Obama to the presidency and the double victory of Democrats in Congress in the elections of November 2008, uh, in the midst of the, the, the financial crisis, uh, um, were in part related to uh, the, this economic shock that facilitated these gains on the democratic side. And also, I think the context of the, the Great Recession justified a greater role for government, as is often the case during these crises. Um, in Canada, the Great, uh, the, uh, the great uh, um, uh, Recession, uh, there's a typo here on my slide, the Great Recession, provided political ammunitions to the NDP and labor unions to advocate for the expansion of the Canada Pension Plan. There was a debate about problems facing uh, uh, occupational pensions in Canada that uh, existed before the 2008 financial crisis, but uh, this financial crisis really uh, hit hard pension funds and also the savings, retirement savings of many Canadians, and it helped the left make a case for um, uh, CPP reform. The same thing happened in Quebec with QPP, the Quebec pension uh, plan. Uh, however, because of partisanship, which is really a key issue, who's in power in the aftermath of a, of a crisis, and, and the electoral results are really important. I mentioned the Harper minority government earlier. When the Conservatives had a minority government in 2010, they actually seriously uh, uh, explore the possibility of expanding the Canada Pension Plan, even if it's against their traditional policy preferences, because that will mean higher payroll contributions. But they explored this idea, they supported it for a while, but in late 2010, uh, Stephen Harper said clearly that 
um, the, his government will not move forward with uh, trying to seek an agreement with the provinces, which is necessary to expand CPP. And so uh, this was uh, pushed aside, uh, but the NDP uh, kept and labor unions kept advocating for this and the Liberal Party put that into its platform, just like the NDP, uh, ahead of the 2015 federal elections. And after the Liberal victory in November, uh, in 2016, discussions took place with the provinces, an agreement which was reached, and the expansion of the Canada uh, pension plan became a reality. That happened, uh, uh, you know, six, six, seven years after uh, the, the 2008 financial crisis, but the crisis helped set the agenda for a CPP expansion and help uh, labor unions and the NDP and other left-leaning actors to justify uh, a CBP expansion, something that also occurred in Quebec with the Quebec pension plan. And so an expansion of the Quebec pension plan uh, uh, followed uh, um, uh, months after uh, CBP expansion uh, uh, became a reality. So um, the issue here is about policy durability. Uh, what can really uh, um, occur in terms of permanent changes uh, uh, coming out of uh, a crisis, economic crisis, uh, other types of crisis as well, like wars. Um, and so there are different factors that, that can explain why something durable can emerge out of these highly volatile situations during which emergency, temporary measures are enacted, uh, uh, but permanent measures can also uh, 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 become uh, um, really a reality along the road. One key factor uh, to explain whether durable social policy uh, becomes a reality is the duration of the crisis itself. I already mentioned the, the Great Depression, how long it was, and it took years for permanent social policy reform to take place in both Canada and the US, in part because of the obstacles related to federalism, as I mentioned earlier. Another factor that we can take into account to understand uh, uh, whether durable policy change can emerge out of uh, uh, a crisis um, is really about the institutional features of a country. Uh, in addition to federalism, as I just mentioned, partisan shifts uh, uh, in terms of um, elections are very important. The, elect the election of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt to the presidency in 1932 uh, helped uh, uh, really uh, uh, create the conditions for the New Deal and the 1935 Social Security Act I mentioned earlier. If you take again the US, the election of Obama and a double majority, a double democratic majority in Congress in November 2008 was instrumental in uh, the enactment of Obamacare and shaped the, the more general response to um, the, uh, the Great uh, Recession. Uh, finally, in Canada, I mentioned already the election of uh, the, uh, well, the, the advent of a, a Trudeau majority government in late 2015, which helped um, really uh, pave the road to CPP reform alongside the role of Ontario, which was pressuring Ottawa to act uh, in the area, and also the NDP victory uh, uh, in, in uh, Alberta earlier in 2015, something I talk about in an article I published with Kent Weaver in Policy Options about CBP and QPP reform. And these factors really help uh, make uh, CBP reform a reality. Uh, uh, and again, CBP reform, I think, is connected in a way to the 2008 financial crisis because it helps set the agenda uh, uh, for um, the debate on CBP reform, but permanent measures regarding uh, uh, CPP at least were delayed because of partisanship, because the conservatives were not so keen in expanding CPP. In the end, they decided not to do it, even if politically it would have been favorable in 2010 when they still had a minority uh, government. But certainly between 2011 and 2015, when they had a majority government, they pushed the issue aside. But Ontario, uh, the liberal government in Ontario, kept pushing for CPP reform, and so did the NDP, labor unions, and other actors. And in the end, the stars aligned in 2016, both at the provincial and federal level, uh, with the Trudeau government, a liberal majority government, and CPP reform uh, took place. Uh, so looking forward, looking backward, 
uh, when we think about understanding why countries react to the current crisis differently and how this crisis might lead to durable policy change, historical and comparative policy analysis can help us identify key factors we can monitor and study moving forward. Historical and comparative analysis helps us understand what is unique about our present condition, but also what is common about it, a situation that helps us pause and find a way to stand back and to contemplate what the past may tell us about an uncertain future. Thank you very much.